Welcome back to the 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. My name is Wayne Kimmel, Managing Partner of 76 Capital, the sports tech venture capital fund. And on this show, I get the opportunity to interview top sports entrepreneurs, executives, broadcasters, journalists, and executives who are truly shaping and many times truly changing the world of sports. And today, we're going to talk sports business. We're going to talk about what it's like to run one of the world's largest sports organizations out there from a journalistic perspective. And my guest today is Eric Fisher, the U.S. editor for Sports Business and the Sports Business Finance Weekly podcast. Eric, welcome to our 76 Capital Leadership Show. Hello, Wayne. How are you? Oh, it's great to have you here. It's 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 awesome. Doing well. And uh, um, how, how are you, by the way? How, I, last time we saw each other was in Las Vegas. And yep. Where are you these days? So I am based in uh, suburban uh, New Jersey, just outside of Manhattan. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so we saw each other out in uh, Vegas uh, earlier this month, uh, uh, you know, beginning to do more and more of these live events. I've, uh, you know, went a long way without a long time without going into Manhattan at all for any sort of events or meetings uh, amidst the pandemic. But that's picking up as well, uh, getting ready to go out to California for the Super Bowl in a couple of weeks. And so things are picking up and it's it's good to sort of be out and about and seeing people face to face because there's no, you know, all of this digital technology is great, but there's no substitute for the real thing. Oh, absolutely. It really is. It's amazing to be out, to be out and about now. And obviously being careful as, as, as you can. I mean, so you're yep. as, as the U S editor for, for sports business. I mean, t t tell us what it means. I mean, to, to lead, you know, sport business from a U.S. perspective and, and just the overall business itself. And, and, and what, are, what are some of the things that, that you specifically focus on? Yeah, so it, it, uh, coming up on three years in this role, it's been a fantastic opportunity, having a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, there are uh, some other uh, trade publications covering the industry of sports. And, uh, you know, I worked for one of them for a number of years and they do a great job. But uh, where I'm at now really takes a look at the industry from a truly global perspective. And, you uh, what I am doing is leading U.S. editorial for a London-based operation that also has uh, offices in the Middle East and uh, Far East Asia. And really putting all those resources together can offer a truly global uh, view and perspective on the sports industry, particularly as the industry itself is becoming more global. And that was really what uh, attracted me to this opportunity is to, you know, sort of uh, uh, carry on the famous Wayne Gretzky quote here is that, you know, I sort of saw this opportunity going to where the puck was was headed. And, and that's, you know, really kind of what I was chasing here is to, you know, be able to, um, be part of that truly global view of the sports industry. And so what I do in my role here is, um, lead the U.S. piece of this. And so uh, events that, and, and happenings that are emanating from the uh, from North America here and, and covering the, uh, the the major uh, professional and collegiate uh, entities here in North America. Uh, that's what I do here. Well, you know, you mentioned, you know, Wayne Gretzky skating to where the puck will be going. Right. And what's next. And certainly that was also you know, you know, something that's that we all think about, right? From a an investment perspective, also every day, kind of thinking about what's the the next next thing in sports that we're investing in here at Seventy Six Capital and what you're trying to cover, you know, at Sport Business. So when you think about like what kind of some of the the big things and kind of the next next things that are coming down the pipe, what are the things that you that you think are going to happen or that you're looking forward to cover this year in twenty twenty two? Well, one of the things I'm particularly keeping an eye on and, and I'm really intrigued to see how it plays out is essentially what happens with the regional model for um, sports media here in, in North America, particularly in the United States, that, uh, as I'm sure you well know and have uh, been discussing in prior episodes, uh, the traditional linear model of the regional sports networks uh, uh, is blowing up before our eyes here, and it's really not economically sustainable in its current form amidst all the cord cutting and everything else. And so one of the major developments um, that we'll see uh, 
perhaps come to fruition here as soon as this spring is Sinclair Broadcast Group that operates the uh, Bally Sports uh, RSNs. They're the largest RSN operator here in the U.S. Uh, they're getting ready to go with a direct-to-consumer service, and really it's a fundamental rethink on that regional model. Um, and there's there's big pressure as to whether it can actually work. And so you've got that whole development butting up against the sense that sports is still inherently tribal, that we all love our favorite teams. And um, amidst all of these other economic pressures, and you know, I mentioned court cutting and so forth, sports is still inherently tribal. People want to follow their favorite teams. These RSNs have been the primary vehicle to do that. Um, and whether this new delivery system will actually work and be able to serve that tribalism, it's an open question and one I'm fascinated to see how it plays out. Absolutely. I mean, you, you talk about the, the RSNs, but then you look at kind of the overall sports industry and how, you know, you look at the top programming back in, in 2021 and how it was, sports. it was all sports, right? Unbelievable. But the most and most of those games were actually on the national broadcast stations, right? Right. Well, and that's an, and that's an interesting sort of juxtaposition there. That yes, the largest individual events. But if you look at the, if you as a person, any other person as an individual, if they look at the totality of their sports consumption um, um, over the sp uh, span of an entire season, and particularly for something a long haul season like baseball. Yes, there are the the big moments, the All Star Game, the World Series, and so forth. But that day to day coverage, that's where you're really spending the greatest percentage of your time as a viewer, and that's really true for most mild to serious fans. I mean, the super casuals probably maybe only drifting in for the marquee events, but if you're any sort of level of a sports fan, that totality of consumption is still really primarily happening at the local and regional level. So one of the big things and one of the big trends and certainly one of the things that, that you know, my team and I at 76 Capital invest in is kind of what's next within the sports betting industry. Yep. My God, right? I mean, the, 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 when if people were asleep, you know, it, it only took the first week of the playoffs to remind people that, you know, the sports betting thing is really happening in a big way. Certainly the New York numbers in the first week. Oh, my God. The yeah. numbers were unbelievable, right? Unbelievable. It's where your, you know, your co-host from your your podcast, Chris Russo, lives. And, uh, you know, I'm in New just, York. I'm just outside of there. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's unbelievable, right? So the, their numbers were bigger that first week than some states have ever done in a month. Oh, yeah. And so where do you think that's all going? So this really puts the pressure on the other three of the big four that the entire sort of betting industry has been kind of really keyed in on the big four, the top four U.S. population states, uh, California, Texas, Florida and New York. Well, New York's come online here and there's legislation in various stages in the other states, although, you know, some of the chatter that you hear that it may not be until 2024 or beyond in some of these areas. But you look at the numbers that are coming in now, even amidst this big tax rate, uh, it really puts a lot of pressure on the uh, um, political uh, establishment in those other three states, Florida, Texas and California, to really get their act together, because there's literally tens of millions of dollars going out the door here that just in this first eight days, nine days that you're referencing here, um, New York's already cleared like $25 million almost in tax revenue. And that's just going to keep going up and up. And yeah, obviously there'll be a little bit of settling here following this initial sort of debut marketing, but we've got other approved sports books that are still yet to come online in New York. So the boat is still going to be rising there. And in my mind, that just puts more pressure on those other three big population states. And then those four in totality, um, Yes, I, I live in New Jersey and I've seen big numbers here and there are big numbers in Pennsylvania where you're at. But those four big population centers are really going to long term going to set the market in terms of all manner of things in terms of user interface, marketing, go to market promotions, uh, you know, odds, whatever it may be, sort of. You know, initially what happened in New Jersey set the tone for the rest of the country. Ultimately, it's going to be these big four states that are going to set the tone for the country. 
Well, Eric, you've been in this this game for a while. You've been in and around the, the sports world and for, for many years now uh, as a journalist covering it all. I mean, have you seen anything like this from a sports business perspective with so many deals happening at so many different levels? I mean, everything from, as we just said, from sports betting to the RSNs themselves to the, you know, companies like like fanatics kind of coming out of quote unquote nowhere to being coming a dominant player in the industry to have a company like Dix who was the comp, you know the sports you know the, the the sports company you know from uh, for to go out and get anything you wanted for sports to go from not doing that great to doing amazing right now because of what's what's happened in the world i mean there's just so much happening have you ever seen anything like this in your career not like this. There's been sort of boomlets. There was the original dot com boom in the late 90s. You know, we had the Daily Fantasy run in 2015. And, you know, there's been these other sort of little boomlets. And you can sort of point to various points in times, you know, fantasy, you know, when that really first went online, that was a big thing. But we're on to something wholly different here. And when you sort of look at the the media disruption that I referenced before, plus the betting, plus everything going on in crypto and NFT. Um, But I think there's even a broader narrative yet that we are so divided on so many different things in terms of race and ideology and politics and everything else. Sports is really the last great unifier. And all these things that I've referenced here, there, there are, you know, you know, sports specific investors like yourself and folks who are really, you know, concentrated in the space. But I'm also thinking about all the money coming from some of the other VC shops, the Andreessen Horowitz's and Kleiner's and, you know, some of the, you know, you know, Winkle Voss and, you know, name, name the entity that they could put their money in any number of different industries in any different number of verticals. And they're that money also increasingly going to sports because you look at the total addressable market, there's nothing bigger than sports. Yeah, it's fairly interesting you say this as, as sports is a unifier. I mean, you, you're, not, you're not asking someone if they're a Democrat or Republican when you're high-fiving with them when your team scored a touchdown. Doesn't matter. Doesn't, Doesn't matter. matter. Doesn't matter. It's it's a, it's a great journey, and I got to ask you, you know, about some of the memorabilia that you have behind you. You know, what are some of your favorite things that you have back there? Is that is that Babe Ruth back there? I can't. That's tell. Lou. That's Lou that's Gehrig. Lou Gehrig. This, okay. this is this is a print. He in 1989. The U.S. I've had this. This is a print that I've had everywhere I've been for. Um, 30 plus years, literally, that the U.S. Postal Service, they did a stamp um, and it, um, of Lou Gehrig back in 1989. And um, that that um, stamp, uh, that stamp and the art that was used for that stamp, um, it, you know, the Postal Service sold it as prints and such. And so I bought it, had it framed, and it's literally been with me everywhere I've been. Um And it's just something I've really identified with on a whole bunch of different levels here that first and foremost, as a baseball fan, you know, he raked and I was grew up a Yankee fan and he was a left handed first baseman and my my much more limited uh, youth career left handed first baseman. Um, But then, uh, you know, Lou, you know, Lou shows up to work every day. He was the original Iron Man. That's something I also really gravitated to. Also a huge Cal Ripken fan. But just the notion of showing up every day and doing your job and not necessarily making a bunch of noise about you, but just going out and showing up for work and raking every day. um, That's something that I really gravitated to. And then it just took on yet another level of resonance later on in my adult life um, where we had... um, ALS, I lost my mother to ALS. And so the Lou Gehrig thing just hit yet another uh, level of poignancy for me. So that's that's Lou Gehrig. And it just it's always meant a lot to me. You know, Eric, you've had had an incredible career as a sports journalist, um, a sports business journalist. I I should really you know clarify that. I mean, in the sense that you've you've gotten an opportunity, I'm sure, to interview some incredible people over the years. Are there a few people or a few stories that really stand out for you when you think when you think back to your career so far, whether that's at the local level, as you said, or the regional or the national now from a global perspective? Yeah. So I'll just I'll tell one little sort of story here that um, 
probably the be- greatest baseball game that I've ever been to uh, was the title game of the 2009 World Baseball Classic between Japan and Korea. And um, when uh, Japan came back to win um, and um, it was held out of Dodger Stadium and I was in the auxiliary. The main press box is pretty tiny, as you know, and I was up in the auxiliary press box up on the sky deck, which is fine because you've got you're right behind home plate, uh, beautiful South Southern California weather and you've got the mountains behind uh, center field just a fantastic vista you can see everything but the game was it, it was back and forth and so dramatic that literally you could feel the upper deck of dodger stadium shaking it was just and again just one of those great all-time games that um I had the the privilege to be at. So after the game, it was just me and one other reporter that was able to corner uh, Bud Selig, then commissioner of Major League Baseball, to sort of get his thoughts on that this fantastic game that we had seen. And I had a long relationship with Bud. Good times, bad times, ultimately good times. I, uh, you know, I think it was ultimately was a. Uh, relationship uh, born of respect and we spent a lot of time with each other but sort of getting butt in that moment where he was literally shaking i was kind of shaking you know because we had all just seen this just unbelievable game with you darvish and and ichiro and all this dramatics and everything and sort of to get somebody who really you know you know, but at that point he had been in and around baseball for the better part of 50 years. And even he was saying that this was the greatest thing he had ever seen. And to sort of see him literally shaking and just so emotional in that moment um, and sort of, you know, again, to sort of draft off of that relationship that I had already established with Bud and to sort of be with him in that moment, uh, you know, kind of a special memory. That's amazing. I mean, you think about, you know, all those times and all those different press boxes that you've been in, uh, the, the, the press room where the, they, they put together the buffet for you to, you know, have, you know <laughs> eat. And all. Is it, have, have there ever, is there any, are there any other, you know, people or stories or people that you've kind of just maybe bumped into maybe at the buffet line, you know, in the press box, you are like, Oh my God, that's so-and-so, or I can't believe I'm about to, you know, sit down and, and, and sit down next to and press row with, you know, somebody like someone sitting. I was another baseball thing. I was out at the all-star game in San Diego, 2016. And I would, uh, the pregame events, um, at uh, uh, before the home run derby, so this would be the day before the All Star game, and I, you know, I, you know, you you run into all sorts of people all the time, but I just happened to be, you know, again, I think I was, uh, um, you know, getting an hors d'oeuvre or something, and all of a sudden, Ricky Henderson w- walks by, and you know, oh yeah, there's Ricky Henderson, um, and I've been at plenty of Hall of Fame things, so I've seen Hall of Famers or whatever, but just like Ricky Henderson going about his business, and not just Ricky Henderson going about his business. But at that point, I'm doing the math in my head. I think a 58-year-old Ricky Henderson looking like he could still play. That guy, just phenomenal shape. And Ricky was a personal favorite when I was a kid. And I I still think he's on the short list of one of the greatest players ever and really somebody who fundamentally changed the game. Um, Yeah. you know, and just to sort of see him in, in, in such a sort of casual, non-assuming way, um, you know, I think it gets to what you're asking here. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, th- those those are the types of moments, those are the types of uh, opportunities that, you know, we're, we're so lucky to be in the sports world where many times you are literally rubbing elbows with or, or doing business with or interviewing some amazing people that, you know, we're – Potentially, you know, your heroes growing up, um, and, right. and now you're 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 you know you're working with them and trying to do some amazing things within the industry today. I mean, and you get to do that on a, on a daily basis, whether yeah. that's with sports business. And now, I you know, I I love what you're doing with your podcast with Chris Russo. Thank you. Tell you. us a little bit about what with that. I mean, you've I think you've done. Uh, done a lot of episodes like 50 episodes or so yeah we're, we're we're just about a year of doing this we uh you know took a week off in the summertime for a vacation took a week off at christmas but aside from that we've been uh, right as rain every single week with a new episode that's great i mean i can't ask you who's been your favorite guest yet because i haven't been on the show yet so i you know <laughs> soon <laughs> uh, but no but but seriously i mean have there have there been certain guests that have either surprised you with things that you just didn't expect to hear from them 
or were there stories about, or even when, you know, when you're just interviewing people in general, where you expect to sort of get a certain line from that person or the way they would specifically answer a question, but they're like, wait a second, this, that's, that's shocking. That's not what I expected. Or, you know, are there, have you had those kind of situations in your career where you've, you know, it's like, wow, that I didn't expect that. Yeah, they, they, the guests have all been great and, uh, you know, really appreciate all of them coming on. One that definitely uh, really comes to mind here um, that we did back in the fall was um, Bohan from Buzzer. Um, you know, this is a very, you know, this is not yet become sort of a fully mainstream sort of company, uh, but I think it soon will be. And they, they've really got something interesting there that the whole model is built around, you know, mobile first content presentation where you're sort of logging into, you know, if you're on Twitter or whatever, you see this great game, hey, the, you know, something like, la you know, what we just saw with this incredible divisional round, if you had been happened to be out and about, um, and, you know, hearing about any of these great games or something in a different sport or whatever, being able to log in right at that moment um, and seeing, you know, and not necessarily getting tied down with some big package or subscription or whatever, but being able to just get into that very particular moment live and in the moment. Um, but Bo's got a very thoughtful sort of approach on this. And, um, you know, and I've seen a lot of different digital flavors on things. And I think what sort of struck me in the midst of that conversation, you know, one, and again, just one of a lot of great conversations, but, um, this isn't just some sort of widget or whatever, you know, Bo's got a real sort of depth of thought as to what they're trying to build there. Um, and the, the whole model is kind of really just really trying to rethink and reorient uh, sports consumption for folks a lot younger than us. Um, and, you know, and as we move on to these other generations, again, you know, I referenced the RSN piece of this at the very beginning of the conversation. Um, and there's going to be more rethoughts on this. And I think Bo and what they're doing at Buzzer is part of that in terms of just taking that very traditional rights model and coming at it from a completely different point of view. Well, I, I also noticed you had one of our CEOs, uh, Davion Ross from Shot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's amazing how they're able to capture, you know, 110 movements a second that a basketball player is making out there on the court. How has that changed in your, you know, reporting on and, and this whole sports industry, how much data and technology has is really, truly playing, you know, such a critical piece to the overall sports world today? Yeah, first off, let me just say that, you know, Davey Allen, that was an incredible interview as well. And, I, and one of the ones that struck me about that conversation, he's built an incredible product, so humble, so unassuming that like, you know, he, he you know, yes, he's so proud of his team and proud of his product. But like, you know, one of the most sort of understated and humble guys you're ever going to uh, come across. That that really struck me about that conversation. I'd be super, curious. Super to guy. Yeah, yeah, super person, um, what an incredible leader, um, and is something not only just for, in, for his business, but also for the overall industry um, and how he just is able to really talk about, you know, just the, the, the sports side of it, but also the technology side of it and how it all comes together. Just really proud to be uh, one of the backers of his company. Yeah. So and so for the data piece, I think what's been good is because you can get lost in the numbers so easily. Um, what I heard very early in the midst of all of this data revolution, and I think it's still been a guiding precept with a lot of good entities, good companies, good teams, good leagues, is trying to find the signal amid the noise and and making sure that there's real learnings, real ROI, and not, you're not just collecting data for its own sake. That yeah, some of these, you know, points of uh, figures are, you know, could be interesting. But what what are you actually learning? Where is this actually leaning, uh, leading? And I think as long as those questions continue to be asked and don't ever get relented upon, you're going to end up in a better place. And I think that's part of what's been a, a, a key of uh, Davian success and other companies in that space is making sure that that learning is still fundamental to everything that's happening. No doubt. Look, when, you know, again, it's it's really been amazing having you on, on our show, Eric. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. You know, as we start to wind down our show and again, you got it. You got to follow follow Eric on Twitter. I, I mentioned this earlier. It's at Eric Fisher, SBG, uh, Eric, you know, Eric is, is one of the senior writers and editors for the sports for sport business. 
Um, Eric, again, thank you. Thank you again for being here. But, you know, just we, we, one of the things I, I wanted to, to, to touch on as we start to wind down here is, you know, our belief at 76 Capital has been that the big technology players are going to be really coming to the forefront of sports yep. at, very soon. Um, it's early in 2022, and Microsoft just made a huge move yep. into the gaming world. You know, 65, 67, 68 billion dollar, you know, acquisition of Activision. Unbelievable move. Um, people who weren't aware of what's happening within the gaming and the esports world, well, it's gonna you're gonna you're gonna see it big time now. Hundred um, percent. What else do you think is going to happen from those really, really big technology players? Well, more rights for for starters. That we've got Amazon. They they accelerated their exclusive with uh, the NFL's Thursday Night Football that begins this fall. And as you start to see more announcements of what they're going to be doing from a uh, talent production standpoint to really support that property, you know, we've got reports that Apple's been in you know increasingly serious conversations about a uh, rights deal with uh, Major League Baseball. Uh, you're going to see over time, you know, the, these companies are sitting on so much cash, uh, you know, whether it be Apple or Google or what have you. And obviously, Google's already done some things around the margins with YouTube as well. Uh, but ultimately, seeing more and more of those companies coming into what we would consider the traditional rights space, because if it, if it really comes down to a number standpoint, they can blow a Disney or a Comcast out of the water when if it comes to writing a check. The, the, the hang up on this point is being able to support those tens of millions that are on a major event, being able to support them on a concurrent stream and do it with low latency. Ultimately, those technological hurdles are going to be increasingly solved. And that's really one of the last fundamental barriers that you're going to see. And then, it, again, if it becomes a check writing competition, then all of these tech giants, they're going to blow the traditional media players out of the water. Well, that's a big statement. And I completely agree with you. And it's one of the things that, you know, you think about where you see, you know, some of the, you know, there, there's even rumors now of some of the big TV um, personalities looking to potentially go to yep. Amazon or some of those places. I mean, that's it would have been unthinkable a few years ago. Yeah. And, and, and again, as they begin to support the traditional infrastructure, again, from a talent and production standpoint, um, they're going to resemble in a lot of ways, the traditional network that we all grew up with and got familiar with. Again, the big question that they're going to have is can they you know we're going to get to a point in time that a that an internet stream can support an nfl playoff game you know the tens of millions of people that watch a nfl playoff game can they support that on an exclusive basis and do that in a low latency fashion right now the answer is no certainly within our lifetimes the answer is going to be yes well, we saw Netflix come out with the F1 series. And I mean, I can't tell you how many people I know yep. that were not sports fans all of a sudden are these huge Formula One racing fans all of a sudden. Um, and and now, you know, it looks like there's going to be, they're going to do the same thing with tennis. Some of the other groups are going to try golf other too. golf too. Is, yeah, that's right. And how, how's that going to play out, do you think? Because as we said earlier, you know, many of the big, um, you know, lot, all the live events were some of the top programming on TV in general, on, on traditional TV. But then at the same time, how is sports going to kind of play into this on-demand type of, of world? Do you see other types of, of, of sports-related uh, programming coming out from, from that perspective as well? Yeah, I think we're still in a golden age of sports documentary filmmaking. Obviously, a lot of this started with 30 for 30 and then continued on with The Last Dance and some of the others. Um, there's going to be a, a, the cream's going to rise to the top, though, that for that trend line to continue, um, it's really got to be good storytelling. It's got to be well done. And part of what made The Last Dance work is that, you know, it was Jordan, it was Pippen, Phil Jackson, all those major characters, you know, big names saying provocative things. And so, you know, run of the mill content isn't going to resonate in the same way. Uh, but powerful storytelling with powerful individuals, um, you know, regardless of the sport, that will find an audience. Well, Eric, I think we can go on for, for hours here. Um, and certainly there's so much for you to cover at Sport Business. Um, yep. 
I'm excited to to keep reading and watching and sit, watching your shows and listening to your podcasts and and all the things that you're doing. Keep up all the great work you're doing, Thank and you. uh, we're, we'll keep trying to make more news for you. That's great. Love it. Well, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Make sure that you follow Eric Fisher at Eric Fisher SBG on Twitter. Uh, watch watch his shows, listen to his podcasts, and what and of course. Tune in for our next episode of our 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. Eric, again, thank you so much for being on. It was a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. And everybody, as you know, what you got to go do is just go out there and make it happen. And that's how we'll all you know, make this world a better place. Really appreciate it. Thanks, for everybody, for tuning in for this edition of our 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show.